Hello, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County, Mississippi, joining you for another of these online presentations. Uh, we're going to keep doing them as long as everybody keeps listening. Uh, so I appreciate if you're being here, and I also appreciate if you are watching this online on YouTube. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we are going to be talking about fruit trees for the home landscape. Uh, this is going to be part one of fruit trees. Uh, there are a lot of fruit trees out there and there's just no way I could get to all of them uh, in the space of one presentation. So look out in the future uh, for part two of this where we'll talk about some of the other fruit trees uh, that people grow in their home landscapes here in Mississippi uh, and in the surrounding region. Uh, so uh, today we're going to start off talking a little bit just generally about growing fruit trees. Uh, we're also uh, going to get into apples and pears and then peaches, plums, and if we have time at the end we're going to talk about figs. Uh, so if you are watching on YouTube and you have any questions uh, just go ahead and put those down in the comments section. I will get a notification and I will be happy to come back later uh, and answer that question for you. I also appreciate it if you would hit the subscribe button. Uh, that's going to give you a notification every time we put up a new video. Uh, so that way you can stay involved with all the programs we're doing. I'm going to go ahead and get started and talk about just, uh, you know, when we're, we're going to have a fruit tree in the home landscape, we do want to select the right location for it. Uh, having a good location is going to be really important for the success of those fruit trees in your home landscape. And just broadly speaking, in almost every case, uh, what you're going to be looking for is an area that is going to have really good, deep, well-drained soil. Um, and, you know, because you know, very few of our fruit trees are going to appreciate an area that has uh, a lot of water holding in it, uh, that can really negatively impact the growth of the plant. Uh, another thing that we really want to pay attention to when we're talking about fruit trees is they can be susceptible to cold injury. Uh, and because of that, we want to avoid any low areas in the landscape where cold air might accumulate. Uh, it's a really good idea whenever you're planning out your landscape to really you know, go around and look for those areas where you tend to have a little bit lower temperature that's just not going to be the best area to put a fruit tree. Uh, and generally, again, all of our fruit trees are going to want to grow in full sun. Uh, that comes with my standard disclaimer that whoever invented the term full sun did not live in the southeastern United States. Uh, so full sun generally is going to mean around eight hours of sunlight a day. And generally, it's better when they get that sun in the early part of the day. Temperatures are going to be lower. Not only that, but that sunlight's going to warm that plant up quickly and take some of that moisture off the leaves, which can really present, prevent a lot of disease problems. Uh, and you know, having a little bit of shade in the afternoon is perfectly OK, uh, just to avoid some of those extreme temperatures we get in the afternoons. Uh, one thing that is very important for fruit trees is making sure that we have a variety that is going to grow well in our area. Uh, there are two things that I, I want to principally uh, concern myself about. Uh, the first there is going to be the chilling requirement for that variety of fruit tree. Uh, so chill hours, really just the temperature, whenever the temperature is between 32 degrees and 45 degrees, and it, the plant needs a certain amount of that time in order to know that the spring has shown up and break dormancy. And those chilling requirements are going to vary and can vary significantly, uh, both by the species of the fruit tree uh, and by the variety of the fruit tree that we're planting. Uh, now, if that chilling requirement is too long, uh, that plant is going to break dormancy late or it's not going to break dormancy very well. Uh, and because of that, we aren't going to get very good fruit production for that plant. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if the chilling requirement is too short, uh, that plant may break dormancy early. And because of that, uh, you may have cold injury to, uh, to, your, uh, to the, the flowers and the buds of the plant. 
which really are most susceptible to those cold temperatures. Uh, another thing that can be very important when we talk about plant varieties uh, is that there are some plant diseases that can be particular, particularly damaging to fruit trees. We're going to discuss some of those over the course of this presentation. And selecting varieties that are resistant to, to those diseases is one of the easiest and most effective ways that we can manage diseases in our fruit trees. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about chilling requirements, just kind of give you a good idea of what we're looking at throughout the state of Mississippi. Uh, and if you're you know, from one of our adjoining states, uh, you can uh, kind of see where you're looking at while we're, uh, while we're talking about this. And of course, I am on in the very extreme coast of Mississippi, uh, the southernmost part. Uh, so down here in the very southernmost part of Mississippi, we of course have the warmest weather uh, and get the fewest chill hours. Uh, so, you know, kind of looking at Hattiesburg, uh, on an average Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, which is down a little bit, going to be a little bit north of us, uh, is going to get somewhere between 400 and 600 chill hours. We're going to get fewer than that. So very important to select low chill hour varieties in order for us to get fruit production when we grow plants down here. Uh, around Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and the area level with that, they're generally going to get 600 to 800 chill hours. Starkville, uh, which is, of course, where Mississippi State University is located, even with Columbus and Greenville and Greenwood, uh, they're going to get somewhere around 800 to 1,000. Uh, and up in the very extreme northern part of Mississippi, they may get as many as 1,200 chill hours uh, as part of that average. Uh, so keep in mind what chill hours you're going to get. And I would encourage you to go on to the MSU Extension website, extension.msstate.edu. Uh, and there is an app that you can use in order to figure out how many chill hours you actually get at your location uh, how many chill hours you got this year and how many chill hours that you're going to generally get on average in that location. And that is a very good question to ask uh, when you're talking to a nursery person about buying a fruit tree. How many chill hours does this plant require? Because you want to make sure that that's going to be something that's going to be adapted to your landscape. Uh, also, when you're buying trees, of course, people buy uh, fruit trees, you can buy them bare root. And very often we buy them as container plants. Uh, do keep in mind that smaller plants are generally going to be a lot less expensive uh, and easier to transplant. So much easier to get into your landscape. Uh, and really they're, they're often going to produce fruit just about as quickly uh, as a larger tree. Uh, and they're going to undergo a, a significant amount of you know, less stress as they're transplanted out in the landscape. Uh, what we're looking for as a plant that, that's two to three years old, you, you don't want a whip or you know, a, just a, a newly grown shoot. Uh, so you want it to, uh, to have a little bit of size to it, uh, but you don't want it any larger than that. Uh, if you do have uh, bare root plants, you want to make sure uh, that you protect those prior to uh, getting them in the ground. Uh, if you're going to you know, keep them for any length of time prior to planting, uh, it's a good idea just to, to dig a trough and, and actually bury the roots, uh, put them in some moist, uh, really light soil for, for that short period of time, uh, what we'll call healing them in, uh, in order to protect those bare root plants. Uh, generally for those bare root plants, uh, we really want to plant those in the dormant season, ideally in November uh, into, or, you know, into the very start of October if we can, and that's going to give them plenty of time through that dormant season to establish that root system and get ready for growth in the, uh, in the spring. Uh, now a container plant gives us a little bit more leeway in terms of when we get them in the ground. Uh, and we could plant them really any time from September all the way through May. I'm glad to know that because I have some waiting at home for me to, uh, to get them in the ground. Uh, but being in containers just uh, gives them a little bit more uh, support and a little bit more developed root system that's going to allow them to establish easier. 
still a good idea to get those in in the, in the, the late fall, early winter if we can, uh, but still okay to get them in. So, you know, once we start getting into the heat of summer, that's very stressful for those plants uh, to, to get established in the landscape. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of transplant stress if we try to do that. Uh, when we put new, uh, new trees in the landscape, it is uh, you know, really important to make sure we're taking care of them. Uh, one way we can do that is to prevent any competition they might be experiencing. If there are weeds in the area or even grass in the area where those trees are growing, uh, that is going to be competition for moisture and competition for nutrients that those newly growing fruit trees really need. Uh, so it's a good idea to include a mulch as part of the planting. Uh, and you can use pine needles or hay or straw or leaves. Pine bark mulch is perfectly fine as well. Uh, do be aware that if you're planting in a, in a poorly drained area, which I don't recommend we do in the first place, uh, that mulches are going to help that area retain moisture. Uh, so that can just worsen that problem. Uh, another issue we can face with mulches is as they break down, the bacteria that are involved in that uh, use a lot of nitrogen. And so we may need to increase some of that nitrogen fertilization as we get into spring. We, we want that vegetative growth uh, in order to uh, make sure that the plant has everything that it needs. Uh, even if you do have uh, grass, you do wanna just mow that really closely that's going to lessen the growth of the grass, lessen its moisture use, lessen its fertilizer use uh, in order to kind of reduce down the competition uh, that those plants have. And uh, it really does have a, a drastic effect on how quickly that plant is going to grow, uh, just mulching it and reducing some of that competition down. Now, one of the questions that I frequently get, so important in putting it you know, at this early part in the presentation, uh, is that occasionally fruit trees do fail to bear fruit. Uh, and there are a lot of potential reasons why that may be the case. The first and most common reason, if that fruit tree is newly established, it's going to take it several years to grow into its location, to put on the, the degree of vegetative growth that it needs in order to support fruit production. So one of the first things that we can, we can do is just be patient with it and make sure that we're giving it the time it needs to grow to maturity when it can produce those fruit. And now aside from that, there are some environmental things and cultural practices uh, and, and factors associated with pollination uh, that can also affect whether trees will bear fruit. Uh, and certainly if, if there's inadequate pollination, uh, then the trees may, may not, they'll flower, but they, they don't show any fruit. Uh, or if they do start to, to grow fruit, those fruit may shed uh, and you wind up with a lot of fruit on the ground. Uh, so uh, it's important to know for the fruit trees that you're growing, whether they are self-sterile or self-fruitful. Uh, so a self-sterile uh, plant, is unable to pollinate itself and other, other plants of the same variety cannot pollinate that plant. So in any case where you have a self-sterile fruit tree, you need to have that fruit tree and a second one of a different variety in order to make sure that you get proper pollination. Uh, some are self-fruitful. Uh, peaches are a good example of that. They can pollinate themselves. Uh, but they're still generally going to be improved by having another variety around. Uh, one other thing that can cause uh, fruit drop is over fertilization, particularly if we give the plants a lot of extra nitrogen. Uh, that promotes a lot of vegetative growth on the plant. Uh, and as a result, sometimes it, it won't decide to put on any, uh, um, any fruit, fruit for that year. Um, there can be some insect and disease problems that can cause fruit drop. Uh, if you have adverse weather at the time of bloom, uh, for instance, we had some really cold temperatures uh, kind of late in uh, into February. Uh, some of the earliest blooming plants had already started to put on buds and flowers, uh, and that's gonna knock those plants back and we may not see fruit on them this year. It can also interfere with pollination 
you have a lot of rainy weather and the bees can't get to the, uh, get to the flowers, uh, that can be it. Now, another thing we want to keep in mind is some degree of fruit drop is perfectly normal. Uh, very often fruit trees produce more fruit buds uh, than they're able to actually have mature fruit. And so they'll naturally, as part of their physiological processes, drop those fruit. And, and that's not a bad thing. We want them to do that because the fruit that remain on the tree are going to wind up being larger and better quality. Uh, one of the things that we'll discuss as we talk about some of the different fruit trees is intentionally thinning fruit in order to get that higher quality, better fruit that we, uh, that we might want. Uh, so now I'm going to get started talking about uh, some of the fruit trees here in uh, the southeastern United States. I'm going to start off with apple. Uh, of course, apple is, is kind of the classic uh, American fruit tree. Uh, the, the scientific name is Malus domestica. Uh, it's in the same family as roses, the rosaceae. Uh, and it's in the same, uh, same subfamily as many of our other fruit trees. Uh, originally, it's native to eastern Turkey. Uh, and to uh, Asia Minor, the Russia region. Uh, but it was brought to North America with colonists in the 1600s, uh, been growing here uh, as, uh, as part of our culture for a very long time. Uh, and there are many different cultivars of apple, uh, you know, around, probably far more than 100. Uh, but most of the apples that we, uh, that we see in grocery stores really come down to about 10 different varieties that are just really successful in cultivated production. Uh, now, as we're getting into the, the modern era, uh, we're starting to see a little bit more uh, broader expansion of the varieties that are available. You start to see some club apple varieties, things like honey crisp apples uh, that have become very, very popular. Uh, of course, apple trees, uh, like many of our fruit trees, are grafted onto a rootstock. Uh, there are different kinds of apple rootstocks. Uh, so the standard rootstocks is, you know, or, or the standard size uh, rootstock is going to produce a tree, you know, that gets up to about 30 feet tall and can produce, you know, 30 bushels of apples in a year. Uh, so you can kind of think of the, the traditional idea of an apple orchard where the, you know, have these large stately apple trees. Uh, the Difficulty with that is that those trees are quite large. They're, they're very difficult to work with. Uh, you have to you know, use uh, ladders or cranes and things like that. So there's a lot of labor that's associated with that. So uh, one thing particularly done in commercial uh, apple production and some for the, you know, certainly for the home market as well is the use of dwarfing rootstocks. So there are semi-dwarf and dwarf rootstocks um, tend to produce a, a much smaller tree that's much more manageable, much easier to work with, really reduces the amount of labor that's you know, associated with just maintaining the tree uh, and certainly with harvesting the apples. Uh, and they also get a little bit earlier production of the apples, so the, the, they'll produce a little bit faster. Uh, so we can group apple varieties into different kinds. There are spur type apples and non-spur type apples. Spur type uh, have spurs. They bloom on those fruiting spurs. Uh, you can see a picture there up the top. They tend to start production a little bit earlier. And then you have non-spur types that bloom on flower buds at the shoot tips. Uh, spur type apples, again, tend to be a little bit smaller. Uh, and you do want to keep in mind that apple trees are a generally self-sterile. So you have to have more than one variety of apple tree in order to, uh, to make sure that you're getting good production. They are primarily pollinated by bees. Uh, they have gorgeous white flowers, a really attractive tree, uh, great for, an orna for ornamental value as well as for, their, uh, for the fruit that they produce. And when you're selecting varieties of apples, you do wanna make sure not only that you're getting apples that suit your chill hour, you wanna make sure they bloom at the same time uh, so, you know, selecting those varieties for apples can be really important. Uh, and again, always pay attention to the chill hours. It's very difficult to produce apples in the, the southern part of Mississippi. As many of those varieties just have chill hour requirements that's that are difficult to get. 
uh, this far south in the state. Uh, some varieties that work really well for northern Mississippi, uh, Gala, which is a, a very popular medium-sized apple, a really highly productive compact tree, tends to ripen in late August. And as we go through the presentation, I just want to note, uh, I've always got a number after all of the variety names. And the reason I have that, that's the chill hour requirement uh, so that you can, uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, if I don't mention it, I've tried to make sure that I include that requirement, uh, chill hour requirement uh, on each of the variety names uh, so you get a good idea of what you're looking at. And certainly there are apple varieties with much higher chilling requirements and there are many other varieties that might do well in Mississippi. I've just selected a few out to talk about. Uh, Arkansas Black is a, another good one as a really attractive uh, apple really good for fresh market uh, ripens you know in, in September to early October. Uh, one of my personal favorites I love the tart apples Granny Smiths uh, and you'll see one, you know once you start getting to the Granny Smith apples and the Fuji apples uh, you can grow those a little bit down here in southern Mississippi because they have chill hour requirements around 400. Um, Granny Smith's a good pollinator for Arkansas Black northern further north in the state uh, and Fuji apple is another good one uh, that just works really well, uh, has a, a really good high quality fruit. And a lot of these are ones that you're also going to see in grocery stores. Uh, now down in coastal Mississippi, you're going to see Golden Dorset as a, a really good variety, uh, about 350 hours for it. And, and it's a good pollinator for Anna, which is another one of our varieties. Um, you know, Anna, you know, in, in you know, Golden Dorset is a, a, a derivative or a carry on uh, from the uh, from Golden Delicious Apple or Yellow Delicious Apple rather. Uh, so it has a nice yellow fruit to it. Anna is a red apple, uh, works really well if you know, down here really far uh, on the southern part of Mississippi. Um, Einsheimer's been around for a long time. It's another really common uh, variety that you'll see. Uh, at nurseries here, uh, and you know, a, 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 an oddity out of the apples is that it is a self-fruitful apple, uh, but it still will you know do really well if it has a pollinator as well. Uh, and Fuji again, you can grow it throughout Mississippi. It's a very attractive apple as well. So uh, right along with apples, we get into pears. Uh, scientific name for pear is Pyrus communis. Uh, pears grow well throughout the state. Um, like apples, most of them are grafted and they're grafted onto Pyrus caloriana or calorie pears. Uh, there are wild calorie pears in, in Mississippi as well. Uh, and that grafting is really important to provide some resistance to disease, uh, particularly fire blight and, and leaf spots. Uh, and resistance to those diseases is very important in selection of pear varieties because they are fairly serious. Uh, now, uh, most varieties of pears, again, are self-sterile. So again, we do need uh, two varieties of pear to get production. Uh, still want to be aware of those chilling requirements. Uh, and one thing that is really notable about pears is, you know, in terms of harvesting them, we actually want to harvest those pears prior to when they're mature uh, and then allow them to ripen off of the tree and that's going to produce uh, a higher quality fruit for us. Uh, there are throughout the United States uh, three basic type of pears that are grown. Uh, there is the European or French pear. So you're not going to see very many of those because they tend to be very susceptible to some diseases uh, so they're, they're very difficult to grow in Mississippi. Uh, more commonly, what we're going to see are oriental hybrids. Um, and those oriental hybrids tend to produce a, a fairly firm fruit uh, that um, is a russeted. So if you look down at the, the bottom picture here, uh, you see that brown sort of rough skin, uh, that's russeting on the fruit. Uh, so European pears tend to be a little bit more smooth skinned. Uh, than the oriental hybrids. Uh, and we'll talk about Asian pears just a little bit separately uh, from, the, uh, from the other pears. Uh, 
Uh, the oriental pears that we grow here in, uh, in Mississippi tend to have more grit cells. They have a kind of a grittier taste to them or grittier mouthfeel to them, uh, but they are very popular for preserves. Um, in terms of growing pear trees, uh, sandy soils are ideal, but in the home landscape, you know, certainly if you have clay or heavy loam soils, you can still be successful with them. Uh, you do want to put them in full sun. And again, just like I said, for apples, having some morning sun uh, is going to reduce the incidence of disease. Uh, and do be aware, you know, pears are going to be one of the first things that blooms early in the spring. Uh, so if we get a late freeze, it is very possible that we're going to see some damage to those blooms uh, as a result of a uh, uh, as a result of the spring freeze. So I mentioned grit cells, and I want to take just a second, just kind of out of uh, general interest, talk about what those grit cells are. Uh, and those are cells within the structure of the fruit uh, that are called stone cells or called sclerids. Um, and those cells, uh, you know, they, they start growing the cell wall. Of course, the cell wall in plants is really strong. Uh, and these grit cells produce more and more cell wall until essentially they're made up of nothing but that cell wall. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is we don't really know what purpose they serve in the plant. Uh, it is possible uh, that they're you know, part of the uh, defense of the plant against herbivory, against things eating it, uh, but uh, obviously hasn't worked for us. Um, but they also might be there as a support, you know, as that fruit is expanding really quickly, uh, they might be there to support the vascular tissue of the plant and just provide a little bit of extra structure. Uh, you can see some pictures uh, really close up uh, of grit cells and see how they're stained and just really, uh, really heavy kind of thick cells there. And a lot of the varieties that have been produced for commercial production uh, have been bred to reduce the number of those cells. Uh, but if you ever feel that kind of gritty, uh, gritty mouth feel for pear, that's what's going on. Uh, now, there are a lot of pear varieties out there. Uh, again, I'm just mentioning a few of them. A uh, really common one that I see here in coastal Mississippi is kefir. Um, kind of a coarse texture to the fruit, but it's really good for canning. Uh, it will be a little uh, cell fruit pull, uh, but uh, really importantly, it has very good resistance against fire blight. Uh, another common one that I see down here on the coast is Orient, uh, another good canning pear. Uh, and uh, another one that I uh, often see at nurseries is Leconte, uh, which of them is probably a you know, really good eating pear. It's a little bit uh, better fresh uh, and blooms really early. Uh, up further north in the state, Moonglow uh, again has a has a higher chilling requirement, so wouldn't prefer uh, perform well as far south as I am. Um, it tends to bloom a good bit later, and uh, fruit ripens in mid mid August. Stores very well. Um, I have uh, one of the recommendations for pear trees um, that I often see is for Baldwin, a very low chilling requirement, uh, blooms very early. Um, but I, oft, I, I haven't been able to find that locally. So uh, that's kind of a, you know, one I'm continually looking for. Uh, now talking about Asian pears, uh, Asian pears, a different species, Pyrus pyrifolia, uh, originates in Southeast Asia. Uh, sometimes these are called pear apples. They have a much crisper flesh. Um, and of course, if you've eaten pears, you know, as that pear matures, it tends to kind of get a soft flesh to it. Uh, Asian pears, as, you, as they've been stored, really keep that crisp texture to them. Um, like other pears, they do require pollinators, um, but they will be pollinated by, um, by the traditional European pears that we grow. Uh, we do want to you know, give them some protection against cold injury. Uh, and there are some dwarf cultivars, uh, so some, some small trees that we can grow uh, that work very well in the home landscape. Uh, there are several different varieties uh, that are recommended. They tend to have slightly higher chill hour requirements. Um, uh, I apologize to anyone for my pronunciation of these names, uh, but Hasui is uh, about 450 uh, chill hours, uh, really good golden russet fruit with high quality. 
uh, Chajuro, around 500 chill hours, um, is partially cell fruitful, really productive tree. Uh, and then 20th century, around 400 chill hours, uh, really productive, stores really well, and has a kind of moderate resistant to, uh, to fire blight. Uh, what really interests me for Asian pears is just the, the quality for eating them. They, they have a really good texture. Uh, and we see a lot of these in, in home landscapes because of that. Uh, now, because they're very similar, I've kind of combined this part of the discussion, training apple and pear trees. Um, if you would like to go into this in much more depth, there's a presentation on the YouTube channel uh, just about pruning fruit trees. So I'm just going to be talking about this in, uh, in very brief, uh, so uh, a lot more detail uh, provided by that presentation that was done by Ross Overstreet uh, on the YouTube channel. Now you do with all the fruit trees I'm going to be talking about, want to start training trees right after you plant. Uh, what we're trying to do with an apple or pear tree is to produce a central leader. We want it to look like a, a traditional kind of Christmas tree shape. We want it to have that really good tall straight up plant. Uh, and so when we first put a plant in the ground, we are going to generally cut them about 30 inches above the ground. Uh, and find a vigorous upright growing shoot uh, the near the top of the tree, and that's going to be our central leader. Uh, we also want to select about four to six shoots below that that are going to become the lowest scaffold branches. Uh, those are the ones that are going to go out and produce the fruit that we want. Uh, so we want scaffold branches that are evenly spaced uh, and come out from the trunk at a wide angle. If they're too narrow, if they're pointed too far, kind of straight upwards, they tend to produce weak branches that can break later. They won't make any, uh, won't make a good scaffold branch. Uh, and we want uh, branches that are going to be about 20 inches at least above the ground. Uh, after the first season of growth, we want to reduce any of those lateral branches down to three to four, uh, spaced about six to in six inches apart vertically, so straight up and down the tree and ideally distributed evenly around the tree trunk. And that's gonna give us that traditional tree shape that we're looking for out of an apple and pear. Uh, now I already mentioned thinning fruit. Um, fruit trees, again, often are going to produce many more fruit than they can mature. Uh, and so thinning them is going, to is going to increase the size of the fruit, improve their uh, color, improve their quality. It's also going to protect the tree by making sure that it doesn't get overloaded and break. Uh, one other thing that can happen with fruit trees when they overproduce in one year, uh, that can set back their production of buds for the next year. Uh, and so by thinning our fruit, we can kind of protect against that biennial bearing and we can get fruit every year. Uh, so most flower buds for the next year are started about four to six weeks following full bloom. Early, that's the period of time when we want to uh, get in there and start thinning. If we thin later than that into midsummer, uh, that'll improve our fruit size, give us better fruit this year, uh, but it won't protect or, or assist the formation of flower buds for the next year. Um, it's perfectly simple. You, you can just re, re, uh, remove fruit by hand. Um, when you do that, just you know, kind of put your hand, your thumb and forefinger on the fruit and just push it off the stem to avoid damaging the plant. And generally you're gonna leave one fruit per cluster, uh, apple or pear, uh, and space those clusters about every six inches on the plant. Even so, you're gonna have tons of fruit. Uh, these these uh, apples and pears can be extraordinarily productive uh, and you'll still get a lot of use out of them. Uh, now, I've mentioned fire blight as a serious disease of apples and pears. Uh, it is a bacterial disease uh, caused by the bacterium Erwinia amylovera. Uh, it attacks the blossom, shoots limbs, and unfortunately, it can kill the entire tree. Uh, it overwinters in infected host plants, so it's very important if you see the, uh, the damage from this, if you see uh, uh, particularly what you'll see on stems, is that the stem is affected and the end of that stem will sort of bend downwards in what we call a shepherd's crook. Uh, just looks like the end of a traditional shepherd's uh, staff. Uh, you may see uh, really dark areas on the, uh, on the fruit tree there. 
Uh, and you know, of course, it is important to use uh, resistant cultivars, uh, remove any parts of the plant, prune away any areas that have been damaged like that. Uh, and there are sprays that we can use for fire blight. That's a, basically an antibiotic that attacks that bacterium uh, in order to protect the tree. But I do recommend if you have a branch that's infected, generally it's just better to prune away and destroy uh, that, uh, that part of the plant to prevent any infection from carrying on to other parts of the plant. Uh, another disease we may see in, uh, in apples and pears is cedar, cedar apple rust. This is a really interesting disease because it requires two different plants in order to go through its life cycle. Uh, so there are a number of different cedar rusts and they go through, go from cypresses to members of the rose family. Uh, so this one, cedar apple rust is caused by Gymnosporangium juniperi virginiae. Um, say that five times fast. Um, and it starts out on Eastern red cedar uh, and it moves to apple or to crab apple. Uh, it actually overwinters on galls on the cedar tree. So you have to have these kind of brown galls on cedar uh, as, uh, as they get wet in the spring and get warmed up, those uh, kind of put out what are called spore horns. Uh, you can see an image of that down at the bottom. Uh, all those orange things are producing spores uh, that just get blown, in, blown into the air and will travel to apple plants uh, and produce those, those spots that you see on those apple leaves. And it can be pretty damaging uh, and can be important to manage that with some fungicides. Um, because it's generally not practical to remove any cedar trees that are, you know, where you're growing your apple, uh, apple trees. Uh, so uh, several different fungicides are effective. Uh, if you think you have your pro this problem, I would recommend calling your county extension office to get that recommendation. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about peach trees. Uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit long today. I hope everybody's okay with that. Uh, Prunus persica is the peach tree, uh, literally means the gift of Persia, uh, started off in China, and was brought to Rome through Persia, uh, and then expanded throughout Europe uh, by Alexander the Great, uh, introduced to the Americas in the 1600s, uh, actually then back to England, uh, and then into the colonies uh, to start being produced in Virginia. Uh, always grafted onto rootstock that's uh, there for uh, tolerance against soil pests and diseases. Uh, peaches, unlike apples and pears, are self-fertile. Uh, so they can, uh, they can produce fruit just by themselves. Uh, peaches are very susceptible to waterlogged soils, uh, prefer a, a sandy loam top soil, uh, really good deep 18 to 24 inches uh, with pH around 6 to 7, around 6.5. Uh, late spring frost can be serious. My, my peach trees are already, you know, already have flowers on them. Uh, so late frost can certainly damage that. Uh, I do want to avoid planting in low areas and, so, and full sun. So you see it's very similar to the other fruit trees we've talked about. Um, one thing that is notable, we have peaches and nectarines. Uh, they really are the same thing. Uh, nectarines are just a, a mutation of a peach tree that occurred a very long time ago. Uh, that, that's just a difference in one gene that leads to that smooth skin of the fruit. Uh, other than that, they really are uh, pretty much the same. They taste a little bit different. Uh, and there's some you know, disease susceptible, uh, susceptibility differences. But really, we're going to be producing those the same. Uh, just like apples and pears, we do want to thin peaches or nectarines uh, to control the number of fruit per tree, increase fruit size, all the same things. Uh, generally, we want to do that early in the year, just like we talked about for apples and pears. Uh, and we want to thin them to about six to eight inches apart on the fruiting branches. Uh, even with that, you can get uh, just a massive number of peaches off a single tree. Uh, so you might wind up with 600 peaches off of a mature tree. They're just extraordinarily productive. I also think they're very attractive trees in the landscape with the, the beautiful pink flowers that they put on. Uh, sometimes uh, varieties of peaches are grouped into freestone versus clingstone. Uh, that just means how much the flesh of the fruit clings to the pit. Uh, a freestone peach comes away easily and a clingstone peach is going to cling to that pit. 
Uh, very often we're going to see freestone varieties in fresh, fresh mar market production, clingstone varieties used for preserves or for canned peaches. Uh, and of course you do have some that are uh, uh, semi-freestone. Um, now, um, I just saw a question in the chat area. I, I thought the coast didn't have enough chill hours to produce uh, peaches. And, and I, I won't lie to you, it is certainly a challenge to get peaches to produce here. Um, I just love the trees, so I have them anyway. Uh, and I know people who produce uh, peaches every year. Uh, so it just may be a matter of, you know, right, you know, the little microclimate around you uh, as to whether you get enough chill hours in order to get these peaches to grow, but as pretty as they are, I think it's worth the risk to uh, to try and produce them at uh, in the home landscape. Obviously, you want to choose some varieties that are going to have the lowest chill hours. Uh, so, Florida King, La Festival, or La Feliciana uh, are going to have relatively low chill hours um, and uh, and some pretty good qualities. Florida King is probably the most common one that I see. Uh, at nurseries or, or stores here in the, the southern part of Mississippi. Uh, as we get up into the northern part of the state, our options get a little bit wider and we have more chill hours to work with uh, and we can see some of that production a lot easier. Uh, just wanna take a few St. Plums, uh, Prunus species. Uh, there are three different kinds, you know, again, very similar to peaches in, in their cultivation. Uh, but you have the European plum or, or Prunus domestica, tends to have higher chill hours and, and be a little bit susceptible to disease. We also have Japanese plums, uh, which is Prunus salisiana or uh, 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 salicina, excuse me. Uh, and then you have some American species. We're all often cross with those other varieties uh, in order to give them some hardiness and some disease resistance. Uh, Japanese type plums are early blooming, uh, produce a little bit better. Uh, we don't see a lot of commercial plum production because there are some disease issues, uh, susceptibility to late frost damage. Uh, like I said, very similar in their production to uh, peach production, but it's really important to note that plums are self-sterile. Uh, and so we have to use a, a, another plum in order to have uh, cross-pollination uh, and it's important that you use the same type of plum. So a Japanese plum to a Japanese plum, a European to a European. Uh, though Methylly Bruce and Aw Amber, three of the varieties I'm gonna talk about are all self-fertile uh, and they can be used to pollinate most other plums. Uh, so here are some varieties, um, Aw Amber or AU Amber, uh, really nice uh, red purple skin, uh, self-fruitful Bruce, uh, is marketed or harvested as a green plum, uh, really good late, uh, uh, late frost uh, production. Uh, Methylene is probably one of the more common ones that I see down here. Um, has a really good, nice purple skin color. Um, and if you want to watch out for black knot, we'll talk about that in a second. And I wanted to include a, a lower uh, chill hour requirement. So I, I included Segundo, uh, often picked as a green plum. Uh, but not self-fertile, so you need to include one of these others in order to, uh, to pollinate. Uh, again, very quickly talking about uh, pruning, there's a, there's a lot to go on there. Uh, generally, we're going to prune in late winter and early spring before bud break. We're going to start off pruning in that first year, and unlike with apples and pear trees, our goal here is to produce an open vase rather than a central leader. Uh, so we're going to cut that plant back to around two feet to two and a half feet. Uh, and as we do that, several branches are going to emerge. After we do that, several branches will emerge near the top of the remaining stem. Uh, we don't want uh, scaffold branches higher than 30 inches. That's going to tend to make the plant top heavy. It'll, you know, and give it problems with uh, standing up. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do um, remove any lateral branches to within one and a half to one inch of the trunk. That's going to you know, keep that, just those scaffold branches there. Uh, after growth starts, any new growth except those four to six branches uh, is going to be removed. We're going to keep those really evenly spaced around the trunk 
again, what we're looking for is kind of like a vase shape uh, for the structure of that plant. Uh, after the first growing season, in the dormant season, we're going to remove uh, or reduce the number of lateral branches down to those three or four, keep them six inches apart vertically, uh, equally distributed around the tree trunk, just produce that vase shape. After the first growing season, uh, we want to remove any terminal buds off of those scaffold branches. We want to make sure it produces a lot of leaves. We get enough leaf cover on the plant. Uh, prune, make sure we're keeping that vase shape. Uh, as we get into the second and third year, uh, we're continually training it, training those scaffold branches out to a 45 degree angle. Uh, so occasionally those scaffold branches, they may start to try to tend upwards. Uh, if necessary, we may need to cut the end of those uh, and allow a bud to come out that we can continue to train at that angle to produce a really good strong scaffold. Uh, we'll also want to remove any sprouts that come up. Uh, there's a tendency for sprouts to come up just kind of growing straight up on the tree. Uh, and we want to remove any of those. Uh, after about the third year, once we have a mature plant, uh, we are going to have some annual pruning uh, just to maintain the fruiting wood evenly throughout the canopy. Uh, buds are formed on the, the previous season's growth. We can generally see those in August. Uh, and about, we want to continually remove or renew fruiting wood by removing any two to three year old shoot growth uh, and leave any new or one-year-old growth. That's gonna keep that new growth forming uh, where those fruit are going to be. Uh, just make sure we keep the height that we want. Uh, once it gets to a certain size, it's really hard to reach those peaches. So keeping the height managed will keep them right within reach. Uh, now there are some uh, peach and uh, uh, plum diseases that can be pretty serious. Uh, brown rot is uh, caused by a fungus. A uh, really serious peach disease, not one we often see on plums, uh, but it, it does attack, uh, attack blossom, twigs, and uh, the fruit uh, from spring all the way through harvest. Uh, when it affects the trunk, we often get uh, these areas where uh, there's sap that comes up, it kind of oozes, it kind of looks gummy, and we call it gummosis. Uh, we may see that you know, a little bit of insect being attracted to that, so there may be some, some bug bits in there. Uh, we'll also see injury on the fruit where you start to see a, a lot of fungal growth, uh, and that will cause the, uh, the brown rot of the fruit or sunken areas with a lot of spore growth on them. It'll eventually mummify down into just kind of a dried husk of itself uh, where, the, where the disease can overwinter. Uh, we don't often see it, but it can also affect the blossoms. Uh, and generally, we need to apply some fungicides in order to control this. It's also important that we clean up around the plant. Sanitation is very important. Uh, remove any damaged fruit or any diseased fruit from, the, from around the base of the tree uh, to prevent that being a source of new, inf uh, new infection to the plant. Uh, peach scab, probably a good bit less serious, another one caused by a fungus. Uh, primarily, the damage is, is visual or cosmetic, uh, though it can uh, provide entry for brown rot. Uh, and if you have an extraordinarily heavy infection where the, the lesions on the fruit kind of join together, uh, that can cause the peach to split. Uh, you can see uh, pictures there kind of those kind of olive green spots, um, but they don't enter the flesh. So even if you do have some of this on the fruit, uh, it's still perfectly edible, and uh, it's just kind of a, a visually uh, unappealing thing. Uh, black knot can be a really serious one. Uh, it's caused by the fungus Apiosporina morbosa. Um, primary symptom is the outgrowth or knots on shoots and branches. Um, Um, and uh, those old knots are really hard, really black. Um, so really, the, the symptoms as they first happen on new shoots are very difficult to see. Uh, they have kind of an olive green color to them. The knots are quite small. So very often, what you know, the first thing we see are these black knots. Uh, we want to prune those away. Uh, you want to go back on that branch about four inches below where we see that knot. 
uh, because uh, very often it's invaded parts of that plant a little bit further than where it's apparent. Uh, generally do this in, uh, uh, in midsummer, and there are some fungicides that can be applied for it uh, during uh, the period of time when shoots grow and when they can be infected. Uh, now, of course, the, the bane of all peach tree growers in Mississippi is the peach tree borer. Uh, this is the, there are actually two. There's the peach tree borer and the lesser peach tree borer, uh, though the peach tree borer tends to be more, uh, more damaging. Uh, it's kind of a wasp-like moth that flies during the day. You can see a picture of it there. Uh, that bright uh, orange section on its abdomen uh, and clear wings makes it really easy to identify. Uh, the wasp, or excuse me, the, the moth, the adult is not the really damaging stage, but it, it lays its uh, eggs down at the base of the tree, uh, and those will bore into the trunk, and you can see damage from that down, at, uh, down in that bottom picture. Uh, and, you know, over time, uh, the, the plant, the moths are actually more attracted to the damaged trees, uh, so over time, that can build up damage and eventually cause the death of the tree. Um, one thing to, to note, the lesser peach tree borer is a little bit more prone to attacking higher up on the plant. Uh, so it might attack on scaffold branches. If you do have that happen, you may need to prune that uh, part of the plant away uh, if it's been, it been in, uh, overly damaged. Uh, best thing we can do for beech tree borers, try to keep the plants healthy. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, particularly those uh, young plants are, are very, very susceptible, vulnerable to damage. Uh, so we really want to pay attention to that. And we, we tend to see peach tree borer late in the year, uh, in August and September. That late period of August and early period of September is when we see them the most. Uh, and if we, uh, particularly if we have these young vulnerable plants, or if we've had some damage with peach tree borer in the past, um, you can spray permethrin down on the uh, on the, that area of the plant that tends to get affected, uh, and that will serve as a barrier. But it does need to be reapplied, so you'll need to have a spray program to help prevent against the uh, infestation by peach tree borers. What that permethrin does, basically kill the caterpillar as it's attempting to uh, attack the plant. Uh, another really serious one is granulate ambrosia beetle. Uh, it is a very small beetle. Uh, you, you may never actually see the beetle itself. Uh, it is less than an eighth of an inch long. Uh, it attacks a range of trees, so uh, fruit trees and landscape trees. Um, and they, they bore into the tree and they actually inoculate the tree with the ambrosia fungus, uh, which is what they eat and it is actually what does the majority of the damage. The easiest sign to tell if you have granulated ambrosia beetles, uh, you'll often see the trees declining, so the yellow and wilt, particularly when the temperatures are higher. Uh, and they'll have these sort of toothpick like uh, you know, sawdust or packed frass or um, you know, uh, ground up plant tissue uh, that come out from the plant. You know, if you have wind or rain, that will knock that down to the base of the plant. Um, but you'll, you'll see that sort of sawdust like material there as a sign of that injury. Uh, they tend, do tend to be uh, most active in the spring when they, uh, or most attacks happen in the spring. Uh, like with peach tree borer, uh, plants that have already been attacked are more susceptible. Um, but uh, attacks are kind of sporadic. You know, you may have seven plants and one gets affected and none of the others do. Um, if you do have a tree that dies because of granula granulate ambrosia beetle, uh, it is a very good idea to just destroy that plant uh, material entirely to prevent uh, any, any beetles flying away from it and attacking any nearby trees. Uh, and as the beetles become active, uh, again, you can spray permethrin uh, at uh, regular intervals uh, as a way to, uh, to, uh, uh, to kill any beetles that are attacking any of your trees. Uh, now, I'm going to go a little bit long. I hope you don't mind. We're going to talk uh, very quickly about figs. Uh, what we grow here in Mississippi is the common fig, Ficus carica, uh, in the family Moraceae. 
Uh, it is the uh, or one of the first cultivated plants um, in the world, uh, native to Asia and to the Southwest Mediterranean. Uh, does very well in the southern two thirds of Mississippi. Uh, now there are several different kinds of figs, uh, and I'm sure uh, many of you have heard uh, about wasp pollination of figs and there being a wasp in the fig. Um, that is for the Capri fig or other kinds of fig, not the kind of fig that we grow here in Mississippi. Uh, one of the things that really is interesting, of course, common figs, we don't, don't, don't require any pollination um, because the fig we eat is actually a flower stem and all the flowers are on the inside of that and the fleshy outside of it is stem tissue. Uh, so not really a true fruit per se, uh, just a, a, a stem with those flowers on the inside. Uh, like a lot of our uh, fruit trees, they do like full sun, uh, want to have some protection from winds in the winter, um, and uh, protection from sun if you can uh, in, the, uh, in the winter as well, because that can cause some bark splitting. Um, they do well in a wide range of soil types. But they do prefer a well-drained loamy soil. Uh, they tend to have shallow root uh, systems, uh, so that can make moisture problems uh, really serious for figs. So it's important to mulch uh, in order to help maintain soil moisture. And generally, if you're in a northern area uh, or more northern area of the state, it's really important to plant those on the south side of the building uh, in order to give them some protection against those northerly winds uh, and a little bit more protection from the cold. Uh, one thing you may hear about with figs, it's what's called a Breba crop. Uh, now figs will generally bear the primary crop in late summer, uh, but sometimes we will see a crop before that. That primary crop is born on the leaf axle, so where the leaf actually attaches to the stem. Um, but some varieties will also give us a crop earlier. It's called a Breba crop, and it's actually produced on the last year's wood. Uh, those are generally will vary a little bit in quality uh, and a little bit sometimes in appearance to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the primary crop of figs. But uh, we can uh, kind of think of it as a bonus crop within the same year. Uh, now, again, there are a lot of different fig varieties. I haven't included your uh, chill hours here because they, they tend to be uh, pretty low uh, for most of our fig varieties. Um, Celeste, and it's, it's not a true fruit as it, was, as it is. Um, Celeste, a very common, a small sort of pear-shaped uh, fig, uh, really sweet taste, and it's probably the most cold hardy of the fig varieties. So if you're in the northern area where figs can grow, it's a good option for you. Um, southern brown turkey is another really good one. Um, has kind of a milder taste to it. Uh, produces a really good crop on young growth. So if you're in an area where figs might die back from cold a little bit, uh, this fig will produce on new growth very quickly. So it works really well there. Uh, and of course, LSU purple is there. Uh, they have a, a number of different uh, varieties like LSU Purple and LSU Gold. They also have an improved Celeste uh, that they've released in the fairly recent past. Uh, really good resistance to foliage diseases I'll talk about there uh, and uh, can produce two crops. Uh, now fig trees are trained to a bush form. Uh, at planting, we want to cut off a third of the plant uh, and force growth of several shoots from the base of the plant. Uh, and then in late winter, uh, after that first growing season, we're going to select three to eight vigorous, widely spaced shoots to serve as leaders. We just want to make sure <clears throat> that they're spaced widely enough apart that as they grow up to several inches, they're not going to impinge on each other, uh, remove any other shoots. Uh, in the second year after planting, prune off a third to a half the length of annual growth of each shoot. Uh, just wait until the danger of frost has passed, but before new growth has started uh, in order to prune. So that's going to be in that sort of late winter time period we're pruning most everything. Uh, and then prune out any dead wood, remove any branches that interfere with growth, uh, and remove any unwanted sucker growth, and just kind of keep that bush form. Uh, in some cases, figs can be grown into a into a more of a tree shape. Uh, it tends to be too cold here, um, even here, to do that. 
so uh, we tend to keep them in a bush shape because the training them into a tree shape uh, here in Mississippi just doesn't tend to actually let them get big enough to produce active ones. Uh, the most common disease we will see on figs is fig leaf rust. Um, you can see a couple of images of it here. Uh, it causes those brownish spots all over the leaves. Uh, very often we will see a lot of leaf drop from the fig trees because of this. And uh, it's okay, the, the fig growth, you know, tends to produce new growth to replace that. Um, and, and, you know, we have to, you know, be careful about applying fungicides, making sure that we're following label recommendations. Uh, and there really aren't a lot of uh, fungicide recommendations for figs. Uh, so uh, my primary uh, methods that I would recommend for managing this on your fig trees is just sanitation. So if you have those fallen leaves, cleaning those up in order to prevent any reinfestation uh, and regular pruning to allow air movement through the fig tree, that's gonna allow those uh, leaves to dry a little bit more quickly uh, and just help out with the development of the disease on the plant. Fortunately, uh, though it doesn't look very good, fig leaf frost isn't, isn't very serious. Uh, and your tree will still be productive even if you have some of those symptoms. Uh, so I know I've spoken for a, a little bit longer than usual today. I'm very thankful that you have uh, uh, stayed with me throughout this. Again, if you have any questions and you're watching on YouTube, uh, please don't hesitate to ask a question down in the, um, in the comment section. Hit the subscribe button. Um, also, uh, this is part one. We have a lot more fruit trees to discuss. Uh, so I'm really interested in talking about some of the other fruit trees that we grow here in the southeastern United States. So loquats and mulberries and persimmons uh, and mayhaw and, and a variety of other fig trees uh, that I also think are wonderful for the home landscape. So thank you very much. Uh,